Tēnā koutou katoa, tolo falava, and welcome everybody to this week's Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Chloe, one of the team from Plunkett Line, and joining me today for New Zealand Immunisation Week, we have Bernadette from the Immunisation Advisory Centre. So thank you so much, Bernadette, for joining us today. Thank you, Chloe, for having me. No, our pleasure, our pleasure. So just before we get going, would you like to just introduce yourself and just tell people a little bit about what you do? Sure. So I'm Bernadette Heafy, I'm Program Manager at the Immunisation Advisory Centre. I'm a registered nurse by background and have worked with IMAC for the last 10 years, but have been vaccinating and working with immunisations people, their families, um, for over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> we don't say that too long. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. All good. So lovely. So a lot of experience to answer all our questions today. That's fabulous. Lovely. So if anyone has any questions before, as we go along today, then please do just pop them down into the comment box. We will get through as many as we can. Um, if you have questions about anything else for you and your tamariki, then please do call our wonderful nurses at Plunkett Line. They're here 24-7 on 0800 933 922. So what we'll start off with today is, I guess, a kind of a base question. Sort of what are immunisations and why are they important for our Pepe and Atamariki? Okay. So immunisations refer to the vaccination schedule that New Zealand has for vaccinating our um, babies, um, infants, all the way through the lifespan um, up until, you know, we're 65 and having our flu vaccines and zoster vaccines. So... Immunisations, vaccines provide a bit of information to the body's immune system to allow the immune system to make a response so that if they come in contact with the real thing, so the, the real virus or the real bacteria, they've got a response on board and baby um, children are able to mount a, a good immune response and beat the ba bug bugs off before they get sick. Um, now... All babies are born with some protection from mum. Now, that protection depends on what mum's been exposed to and what antibodies that she's able to pass over to baby during um, pregnancy. But that wanes, and even with breastfeeding, that protection wanes. So it's really important that the baby gets their opportunity to build their own repertoire of antibodies um, against these diseases. Lovely, and we've already got some questions coming in thick and fast, so thank you everybody. So first of all is, when do we vaccinate babies? When do that, those schedules come out for little okay. ones? So in general, the standard schedule starts at six weeks. So there's a series of vaccines at six weeks, three months and five months. And then we have um, doses at 12 months, 15 months, four years. Then we sort of skip a bit to the young adolescents at 11 and 12. Um, and but if we take a little step back from there, actually baby's first vaccination or protection opportunity is actually when mum's pregnant. Okay. So during pregnancy we offer a vaccine to pregnant women against diphtheria, tetanus and whooping cough and it's that whooping cough protection that we're trying to give mum so that she passes antibodies over to baby to help protect them before they start their schedule at six weeks. Awesome. Um, and the same with flu vaccine as well. We offer, you know, influenza vaccine during pregnancy to protect mum primarily because she's at greater risk of influenza but also she'll pass protection over to baby as well to help protect them before they can have a flu vaccine themselves. Oh, awesome, lovely. And um, when those vaccinations happen as well, another question we've had in, um, how do you calm babies down right after when they've had that vaccine? Not a pleasant time for our poor little one so I'll do make that a little bit nicer. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean that's a really common um, concern, you know, my babies do get upset, injections are uncomfortable, I mean as adults we know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> plenty of big grown, big grown men and women, yes. very scared of needles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the main thing in terms of what's the best event for the parents and for baby will include things like the opportunity for mum to be able to feed. Mm -hmm. So breastfeeding before, during and after vaccination um, is a really important calming measure for everyone involved. Um, for toddlers, distraction, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they do tend to be the ones who stay a little bit fractious for longer afterwards, you know, when they have that indignant look. Um, you know, distraction, get them, um, 
you know, if they've got a favourite toy or even a little bit of that screen time. So, you know, what's their favourite movie that they can have a look at? Um, those sort of things help. Obviously, you know, that initial response to the actual injection is the, you know, the thing that happens during that first 20 minutes while you're waiting and it's just taking that opportunity to, to feed and um, distract. Afterwards, when at home though, it um, can be that children, infants get a little bit upset, um, they can be a bit on the miserable side, they might have sore injection sites. Yeah. Yeah, so some, you know, things like a cool flannel um, can be very helpful. If they are running a, a, a mild fever, then taking some layers of clothing off at the moment, you know, checking what the room temperature is actually like, um, and just offering frequent feeds, plenty of fluids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And if you have any of those symptoms after vaccinations, if you guys are ever concerned, then as I said, call us a here at Plunkett Line and the nurses can go through an assessment and, and see what to do yeah. next, see if there is anything that you need to do or if, like Bernadette says, you can just, you know, have some nice in-home cares just to keep things there. Cool. Awesome. Um, and again, we've got some more questions coming through. So um, with flu jabs, should, um, should babies be having the flu jab? Okay. So the... Flu vaccine is available from six months of age. Um, it is, uh, there are a certain group of children who have medical conditions who are eligible for a flu vaccine, so mm -hmm. it is free. Um, but it is a vaccine that is worthwhile considering for all children. Um, flu can hit children particularly mm -hmm. hard. Um, but certainly if you've got a child who is an asthmatic or a diabetic or, um, you know, they have... A, a chronic medical condition and it's certainly worth thinking about cool. having that vaccine done and, and getting that for free tr from your primary health care provider. Cool. Awesome. Lovely. Um, and we have another question again. So thank you everybody for sending these <laughs> through. Um, how long should symptoms last after vaccinations? Um, is it normal not to sleep as much and feed more for our little ones after they've had their vaccines? There's a variety of responses, um, and you'll see that both in children and in adults as well. You know, for some people, for some babies, they sleep quite well afterwards, mm -hmm. and you, you've got to, you know, disturb them a little bit to make sure that they do actually get their regular <laughs> feeds. Um, and for other children, yes, unfortunately, they get quite grumpy, upset, they can be hard to settle. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can be slow to latch on and you've just, you know, a bit of patience and a bit of time and um, trying not to get too upset about it yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know how babies can sense how you're feeling and they pick yeah. up on that. Um, and just trying to keep it, you know, calm and quiet, um, not too hot um, and, yeah, just offering plenty of feeds. And I know that that's, you know, the not sleeping thing is really difficult because it means you're not sleeping either. Um, so just thinking about how you might manage that and if, you know, if there's the opportunity for other adults to be pre present so that, you know, you can take some time out from that. But what I'd normally say is most of those things settle down within 24, 48 hours. Um, okay. We wouldn't expect them to continue on. And if your child has got, you know, if they've got a significant fever and You've done all of the cooling cares that you can do at home, so cool flannel, taking clothing off, um, and you can consider paracetamol if they're particularly upset or the fever's not settling with those cooling cares. But if you're still concerned, don't hesitate to get them checked out yeah. because there may be something else brewing there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, really important. Lovely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and um, immunising on time as well. What if, um, you, you know... Things happen, life gets in the way sometimes, you've gone a bit late with your vaccinations. Is it ever too late to get those vaccinations? Can people catch up with you, those schedules? You can catch up with your immunisation schedules and we do a lot of um, work with um, primary healthcare nurses in particular around how do we catch children up. Um, children who have come from overseas is mm -hmm. you know, one area as well where the schedules are different and we bring them up to date with the New Zealand schedule. We'd encourage on time, mm -hmm. every time, but understand that that's not always possible. Um, and there are, however, there are some vaccines that are offered up to certain ages. So for things like mm, hip disease, so haemophilus influenzae type B, and pneumococcal disease, generally the vaccines, um, unless your child is at high risk, um, they stop at age five. So there are some vaccines that have... Mm -hmm. Just schedule limits. Okay. Yeah. 
So right. again, something to ask your um, practice nurse about your local GP. Ab yes, absolutely. Practice nurses, practice nurses but get yes. my P's mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> Never too late to, you know, to think about catching up. And if you're revisiting a decision around immunisation and you want to have a discussion around how do I catch my child up, um, and what vaccines are available, then yeah, make an appointment and talk with your primary health care provider. Cool. Awesome. Fabulous. Um, and we're sort of protecting ourselves as well as the caregivers for our little ones. Um, how can we make sure that, you know, we've got all the protection that we need to protect them as well? Yeah, and now that brings us, I guess, in some ways, in a roundabout way, to a discussion about measles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, protection... Um, We've got an age group of people in New Zealand, particularly the 15 to 29 year olds, where we're not, you know, there may not be full immunisation records available, the schedule changed multiple times, um, and you may not have completed both doses of your measles, mumps and rubella vaccine. So if you're unsure about your immunisation history, it's worth checking in with your primary health care provider, seeing what information they've got on record, and you can catch up with your immunisations as well. There is, for New Zealand New Zealanders, there is a programme of free vaccines available, you know, right through the lifespan. So have that conversation. Um, and particularly if you're in that 15 to 29 year old age group, think about whether or not you're protected against measles. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, worth doing. Yeah, definitely. Setting a good example for the kids as well, getting the needle in the arm so they don't feel left out when they get to theirs done as well. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And I was just on that note too, mm -hmm. just thinking about, you know, one of the times when you're both in um, at the, the medical centre is actually when you're taking baby for their immunisation. So mm -hmm. if you've got a delightful little six-weeker mm -hmm. and they're due for their IMS, it's worth maybe just checking at the same time, are you up to date with everything as well? Mm -hmm. And so for the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, you can have that while you are breastfeeding. That is not an issue. Um, we don't give it during pregnancy, but certainly once baby's delivered, Oh, yep, you can awesome. check that one out. Yeah, two birds, one stone, guys. Mm -hmm. Always the way to do it. <laughs> Excellent, lovely. And with having that experience as well, having vaccinations, I mean, kind of going back a little bit, how do you make the actual, you know, appointment a nice experience for your little one too? So it's not too, not too big and scary. I think um, being prepared for it. Um, like in terms of babies, I think being. Um, it's finding the right time to take them in, you know, um, what are their usual sleep patterns? Where will it fit into, you know, when you don't want a, you know, necessarily an overly tired, grumpy baby going in for an appointment, you, because if they don't settle afterwards, you're going to have an increasingly tired and grumpy baby. <laughs> um, being happy about and asking if, the space for you to be able to breastfeed or to you know to feed your baby afterwards, um, to take someone with you, you know, um, it, it's not something you have to do on your own. We see lots of mums come in with um, the little babies, but bring someone with you, whether it's Gran or the father, you know, um, whoever's in the family who wants to come along. Um, for toddlers, I think, as I said before, and even you know the four-year-olds. Um, distraction. Yeah. Yeah. I love bribery with four-year-olds, yeah. personally. <laughs> um, you know, even at, you know, even at four, they are starting to think about they're off to school, you know, can they get a new pencil case? You know, yeah. just something <laughs> that, um, you know, gives them, I'm going to get a reward for being here. Mm -hmm. um, so... But yeah, distraction, whether it's iPad time or a game on the phone or a new toy. Um, you can have an argument with the dental people around whether or not lollies are a good <laughs> idea or, you know, it, it's, but it's about treats and moderation mm -hmm. and all of those things. And, and, and what works for you and your child? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I think, you know, a, a lot of people ask also around their sort of their 11 and 12 year olds mm. and, you know, do I get them vaccinated at school or do I take them to the GP? I mean, in some, and the school program is actually a really good place for those kids to be vaccinated. They're there with their peers, they're able to support each other. Mm. It's a lovely um, and supported environment with the public health nurses who go out and do that program. Mm -hmm. So if your child's okay with having that done at school, it's actually a 
you know, it is a safe place for them to do it. Um, but you can have those appointments at the general practice. Cool. Lovely. Awesome. Yeah, a bit of bribery and corruption. Oh, totally, way. totally. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Lovely. And we've had a couple more questions come in, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, so the first one is around the kind of meningococcal vaccine. Um, is expensive. Why is the meningococcal vaccine expensive? Okay. I, and that's a, a difficult question for me to answer. Mm -hmm. So I guess from the starting point of meningococcal vaccines, there are some medical conditions that they are funded for, okay. okay, and those funding decisions are made by Pharmac and put on the schedule by the Ministry of Health, um, but it's not a wide group of people, mm -hmm. and so, and there's a, the vaccines are recommended, there's two vaccines, so there's a vaccine against meningococcal B, and there's a vaccine against meningococcal A, C, Y, and W, um, which is part of, you know, why it's expensive, there, if you want Best protection against meningococcal, you need to think about both vaccines because in New Zealand we have a balance of what causes um, mm -hmm. the meningococcal disease that we see. Because they are private purchase vaccines, mm -hmm. um, they are, you know, the ACY and W1 is becoming a little bit, um, it's been around for a while now, mm -hmm. but yes, they are, do continue to be relatively expensive, mm -hmm. and also the number of doses that are required. Um, but those prices, because they're on the the purchase market, are set between the what the vaccine company provides them for and then what it costs for the primary healthcare provider to deliver it. Oh. So you will get some variation um, mm -hmm. between different primary healthcare providers as to what it, what it costs. Okay. Um, so yeah, but yeah, difficult... Yeah, not easy question to answer, and especially because we do, you know, we do recommend that parents do consider having those vaccines. Mm -hmm. yep. right. It's really useful to have that insight into yeah. the pricing, so that's lovely. Thank yeah. you. Um, and another question, um, as I suppose more relevant now as we're opening up our world a little <laughs> bit, um, what immunisations does my baby need if we're heading overseas? Right, now that varies on lots of things. Mm -hmm. How old the child is, um, where you're going. Um, where you're staying, because there is a difference between going somewhere and staying in a holiday resort and going somewhere and staying within a family unit, whether it's, you know, you're going um, back to a country that you called your home and you're taking a child into that environment. Now that is, um, and then it's also what vaccines are available, mm -hmm. because they do have um, different ages um, that some can be given, so it, it's a important conversation to have with your primary health care provider, um, there's a, a travel doctor, and alongside that is thinking about the other things that need to occur in terms of travel, is thinking about how do we maintain hygiene, mm -hmm. so thinking about things like nappies, where do I get clean water for making up mm -hmm. bottles, Am I, you know, if, if you're bottle feeding, um, what food are you taking for baby, mm -hmm. um, or your toddler, um, thinking about what they can have here in New Zealand and what you'll be able to access overseas. And my biggest point here would be is if you're taking your child overseas, then make sure they're up to date with immunisations that are on the national immunisation schedule here, mm -hmm. particularly things like measles. Okay. Um, and just make sure if they've had the ones that they're eligible for their age. Um, and have a conversation with your primary health care provider about where you're going and what other things to consider. Awesome. Yep. Lovely. Thank you. Hopefully we'll all be able to head overseas <laughs> a little bit more in the future. Thanks. Fingers crossed. Cool. Lovely. Um, so, ah, so the more questions we've had here. So how do people know when their child needs, needs immunising? Do they get kind of reminders through? Is that typical? Or is it, you know, up to them to take a look at the schedule in the well child there? Um, it's... A mixture. Um, mm -hmm. For the most part though, primary health care providers are really good at recalling for the childhood schedule. Mm -hmm. So normally you'd get a letter uh, around when your child's about four weeks of age. Okay. So in 
giving you some notice for the six week immunisations. Um, alongside that you might get things like an enrolment form for the PHO or primary healthcare mm -hmm. organisation that your practice belongs to, mm -hmm. um, so that they can get your baby registered and they'll be part of your family unit within that um, medical centre. Mm -hmm. So most of the time you probably get notification, I'd say letter, because I'm a little bit old fashioned, <laughs> <laughs> but it might be a text message, it might be a message that comes through one of the health portals like Manage My Health, mm -hmm. um, and, or it might be an email. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th there's lots of different ways that practices are communicating, but I think also it is important that you know people move as well, and mm. we do change cell phone numbers a bit more regularly. Yeah. Email addresses we don't seem to change quite mm. so frequently, but just thinking about how easy am I to actually contact, mm -hmm. um, and if you want to pick up the phone and you want to make that appointment or you want to go into your patient portal and make an appointment, then I'd encourage you to do that. There are, you know, for some areas of New Zealand, it is harder to get appointments at the moment. So if you're being proactive and thinking ahead, then do contact the practice and think about making those appointments. Um, but we, the thing I think um, we sometimes hear is around, can I have immunisations early? Mm, yeah. yeah. So we'd encourage on time, and that means you know at six weeks, mm -hmm. not at five weeks. Yeah. So there are specific time frames just to ensure that we get the best protection, the right gaps between the vaccines, um, and that it allows the child to produce their own immunity mm -hmm. um, to those diseases. So um, if you if you've got questions or you think oh I'm going away or you know something's mm -hmm. happening, you know talk to the talk to the practice nurse around immunisation timing mm -hmm. um, and they'll be able to advise. But yeah, just, you know, schedule is six weeks, three months, five months, 12 months, 15 months, four years, then some adolescent ones. Um, if you're approaching 45, you might get a text message yourself around <laughs> it being time <laughs> to, to cons um, check whether or not you're up to date with your tetanus, diphtheria and whooping cough vaccines. Mm -hmm. And for grandparents, it's 65, you know, become eligible for flu, check diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough booster, and shingles. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. That yeah. immunisation fun never stops. Yes. All the way through life. You think you're over it, but no. No. Right. <laughs> Keep on going, guys. Yeah. Awesome. Lovely. And um, when, you touched on it briefly before, but when we've got lots of, obviously lots of families returning back to New Zealand at the moment from overseas, um, what should they be doing to kind of rejig that schedule and make sure their child's up to date with the New Zealand schedule for immunisations? Okay. So I guess the first thing is find your primary health care provider. Yeah. <laughs> um, get registered, um, get your family registered with a, a general practice. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you've got with you a copy of their immunisation records. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And we really do need to see that. And what we're looking for is what vaccines they've had and at what times. And so you're, generally your practice nurse will go through that information and if you can drop it off so that they have an opportunity to do that before you come for an appointment, um, that's means it gives them time to look at it and then plan what they will what's needed if anything um, and if they've got any questions they can always ring our advice line at the immunization advisory center around how do i catch this child up and get them up to date with the vaccines we have available here um, and yeah so if you want to check get those records get them in and um yeah and we can see whether or not children are up to date awesome Lovely. So I think we've gone through all of our all of our we schedule here, and thank you so much for everyone who's um, sent in their questions to us. Is there anything, Bernadette, that you wanted to cover that we haven't gone over today? Any other hot tips you want to give to the whānau out there? I, I guess my big thing is I just want to encourage you to continue to access primary health care for the standard immunisations um, to say that you know on time is important, but it's never too late to catch up. If you've got questions or you've got concerns, don't hesitate to bring those questions up and have a discussion with whether it's the doctor or the nurse, um, and just to go through any any concerns that you have. Um, and if you've got, you know, if you're trying to make it a comfortable experience, mm -hmm. think about how that works for you and for yeah. your family. Um, yeah, nothing. I think yeah, and. Um, to any you know pregnant mums out there, don't forget that when you get your dose of vaccine, it's giving you the opportunity to pr produce antibodies. 
and to pass those over and help protect your baby um, for when they're born. So it's an amazing gift that you can give them. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Lovely. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much again, Bernadette, for joining us. It's been an excellent hearing. I've learned so much from listening to you as well. So I thank hope you. everyone out there has enjoyed it too. Thank you so much, everyone who's tuned in. And um, as Bernadette say, as any questions, you know, get in touch with your with your medical practice, your GP practice nurse. You can always give Plunkett Line a call as well. You can give IMAC a call too. There's lots of resources out there to help. So thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Poor Marie. And